Turn to Durban Radio. With the weather bulletin for shipping a valid for the period 20, 2200 GMT today, the 15th of May until the 16th of May, 1000 GMT. We have a gale warning today. We have a gale warning. Gale force south westerly reaching 40 knots in the Cape East area and the extreme eastern part of the Durban East. For centuries, the only shelter along this hostile coast and known throughout the world for its beauty and hospitality. But where did the history of sailing for pleasure actually start? England's merry monarch, Charles II, had been in exile in the Low Countries, Holland, since the rebels lopped off his father's head. In the year 1660, he was told, come home, all is forgiven but he was broke and needed transport. The Dutch loaned Charles a zippy little 51 and a half foot vessel with a 19 foot beam, rigged fore and aft, which they called a yacht. His brother, keen on the idea, had the British improved the design and challenged the Dutch yacht. He won. And so the yacht was born, invented by the Dutch, perfected by the English. The royal yachtsmen began racing regularly and soon the sport was pursued by those of refinement in most major ports, including Durban in the early 1840s. We are glad to hear that after a long suspension of this delightful and thoroughly British amusement, yacht racing, it is intended shortly to be resumed on our bay. No sheet of water in the world for its size can be better adapted for the purpose. The newspaper was writing about Durban's first regatta, and a year after those words saw print, South Africa's first yacht club, the Regatta Club, was born and had its first regatta Friday, the 1st of June, 1858. It was won by Fog, followed by Arrow, Dove, and Snake. And that evening, 40 tired but exhilarated gentlemen dined together at Mr. Deer's Hotel, thereby establishing one of the finer traditions of Durban yachting. The Regatta Club was short-lived, but soon after its demise, in March 1863, a meeting of those interested in aquatics was held, and it was resolved to establish an association to be known as the Natal Yacht Club. This club, with the Royal Charter, later became the Royal Natal Yacht Club. But thoughts were heading in other directions, and over several dark nights out on the tug SS William King in Durban Harbour, three men took a decision to form a separate yacht club, to be called the Point Yacht Club. We'll never know what the original inspiration was to form the club, but part of it could have come from three determined men who arrived a few years earlier with a 20-foot sloop perched on an ox wagon and announced that they were homeward bound to Norway. Ingvald Nilsson, Bernard Nilsson and Zephanius Olsen completed their voyage with the eyes of the world upon them, even though these three had only three eyes amongst them. In 1895, members were required to pay one pound, 11 and sixpence to join, and were required to start races with the anchors down. I must go down to the seas again, for the call of the running tide is a wild call and a clear call that 
1896. Captain Joshua Slocum arrived in Durban Harbour. It's not surprising that sailors have a rather slanted view of the landed gentry. By the time this first round-the-world yachtsman had brought his spray into Durban, news of his spectacular feat had reached the central government, which sent a delegation to ask the man to confirm President Paul Kruger's opinion that the world was flat. Slocum was introduced to our own style of yachting. I sailed in the right crack yacht Florence with Captain Spradbro and the right honorable Harry Eskom, premier of the colony. The yacht centerboard plowed furrows through the mud banks, which according to Mr. Eskom, Spradbro afterwards planted with potatoes. By this time, yacht racing had caught the public eye and journalists were dispatching flowing copy. Those who were fortunate enough to be on the Bay Embankment on Saturday afternoon witnessed one of the prettiest sights the lovely Bay of Durban ever carried on its rippling surface. The turn of the century was hectic. Churchill managing to escape from his incarceration. The Duke and Duchess of Windsor pay us a visit. And in 1902, we moved the clubhouse from Hospital Road to Cato Creek. The club was firmly established and tradition began mounting. The first honorary life member of the club was Wilfred Luchaz, followed by Rupert Ellis Brown and the current life member, Richie MacDonald, who recalls the early days when the club held an annual ball to raise money, about a thousand pounds each time. Stuart Sefton was a trustee of the club at the time and apparently only made one mistake in his career. He thanked the wrong lady on the ball committee, a very good looking one, and the committee resigned to the good of the club as they then had to do the work themselves. And that was six months preparation. One of the greatest encouragements to South African racing was the presentation in 1908 of our oldest yachting trophy, the Lipton Cup. In that year, the Table Bay Yacht Club drew up the rules, but overlooked the fact that there were no six or eight meter yachts in South Africa. So it was not until three years later, 1911, that a yacht specially built by the Point Yacht Club could challenge a hastily modified Cape Yacht. There were only two yachts in the race, Tess of the Point Yacht Club and the Patricia of the Royal Cape Yacht Club. All three races were won by Tess, the last by half a second, and Lipton Cup fever became part of South African yachting. The second Lipton Cup series was raced off Durban in July 1912, with 100 spectators following on a steam tug. Three yachts entered, Skabenga of the Point Yacht Club defeated both Erica of the Royal Cape Yacht Club and Protea of the Victoria Boys Club. In 1913 and 14, the Skabenga and the Erica raced again with the same overall results. Just before Sir Thomas Lipton dispatched his shamrock for the America's Cup races, the Point Yacht Club sent him a cable. Skabenga, winner three races, Sincerely wishes Shamrock same success in America Cup races. That year, the Shamrock was called back from the America Cup. War had broken out. The same year the Shamrock was recalled, 
almost spelled the end for the Point Yacht Club. The harbour area was fenced in, and Transvaal Coal Storage broke the clubhouse's lease. Fortunately, the club was not wound down, but the building and furniture were put to auction, and the proceeds, some £1,500, were invested. There were several alternatives, such as joining the Royal Natal Club as juniors, or amalgamating with Herbie Spradbro's Durban Yacht Club. The decision to amalgamate won out, and a clubhouse was built at the Esplanade Jetty, in agreement with Railway Systems Manager Mr. J.R. Moore, that it would have to make its way without a liquor license, which it did quite well, and that when the land was needed, the club would be fully compensated for its building expenses. Yachting became a very popular sport, and by 1921, the Point Yacht Club had 170 members, Interport races were the rage, the 25-foot scows being shipped to the host port. Later, in 1935, when railway lines were built along the Esplanade, the railways paid out the club, and the present club was built. The Lipton Cup challenge was not revived until 1952, when the Royal Natal Yacht Club issued a challenge in the 30 square meter class. Avo Set, skippered by Fred Meadows, took the honors, and the cup was in the Point Yacht Club for the seventh time, and the Lipton fever was firmly established. Arnold Harris was a major proponent for the building of a pub, but at least one well-known member said he was prepared to spend up to a thousand pounds in court to oppose the motion. Charlie Allen spoke for 30 minutes against the idea, but when it was finally carried, walked up to Arnold Harris and said, when do I start work building the pub? The pub was opened on the 28th of January, 1953, and the bar anniversary mug is still sailed for. These walls have witnessed the growth of the Point Yacht Club into the largest and most active yacht club on the continent of Africa, with a reputation for hospitality and keen competition known to all ports of the world, where men and women gather to share the common bonds of sail and sea. Members who have shared the ultimate challenges at sea and made the yacht club what it is today. Members such as Herbie Spradbro, whose boatyard the club used after the First World War when he became Commodore. Rupert Ellis Brown, Mayor of Durban, Honorary Life President of the club in 1946. South African representative to the Olympic Games, founder of the REB class, a yacht designed to bring yachting within the means of younger helmsmen. And Richie MacDonald, who sailed scamp near his parents' home on Salisbury Island, and later 22-foot dinghies, notably Reliance, and was appointed Honorary Life President in 1946, one of the original Deep Enders. Jimmy Deacon, port captain in the 1950s, who made history by recognizing that the sailor's competence and the seaworthiness of his vessel, not the overall length are the criteria for safe offshore sailing. They sailed the sea that never changes, and its works, for all the talk of men, are wrapped in mystery.
Too much living to be done There's no time for any break What's the use of worrying Hope it's something you never do Much rather go sailing It's much more of a crew Now I hope that you'll understand And you realize I think I found a place somewhere It's a playground in paradise Down in Newport Southern California The Hawaiian Islands In South Africa Everybody's sailing It's got what you need to find Gotta keep your head tied down Or it'll blow your mind I hope that you'll understand And you realize I think I found a place somewhere It's a playground in paradise Southern California, oh, the Hawaiian Islands, in South Africa. Everybody's sailing, it's got what you need to find. You gotta keep your head tied down, or it'll blow your mind. I hope that you'll understand. And you realize I think I found a place somewhere It's a playground in paradise Ooh, in paradise Ooh. These yachtsmen set goals in the sport of sailing that we today will never know in those days, there were no lightweight plastics, carbon fiber, and Kevlar. Nor were there onboard computers, wind instruments, nor even stainless steel. Their wind instruments were their eyes on the water, wind on the cheek, and the feel of the boat, with perhaps a thread tied to a shroud. They were the men who founded this club, the Point Yacht Club. Today, we are charged with holding the traditions they laid down. We are sailors. We sail the sea that never changes, and its works, for all the talk of men, are still wrapped in mystery. No, no, no. 